Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Mantel, and I am the co-director of the Health Law and Policy Institute at the University of Houston Law Center, and I will be the moderator for our third panel today. So during the morning sessions, our speakers discussed how disparities in health as well as legal related inequities um, can, you know, and, and asked whether if we increase the diversity of the medical profession and the legal professions, can we um, mitigate some of these disparities and increase trust in healthcare providers and our democratic institutions? So our next panel will discuss the extent to which medical schools and law schools can seek to increase the diversity of their student bodies by taking applicants' race and ethnicity into account during the admissions process. And as you all know, the Supreme Court's recent affirmative action decision in SFFA versus Harvard has some implications for this issue. So let me now introduce our esteemed panel of constitutional law experts. We have Seth Chandler from the University of Houston Law Center, Joy Milligan, who's joining us from the University of Virginia School of Law, Corey Liu, who is an attorney at Butler Snow and a former assistant general to Governor Greg Abbott, and then our final speaker will be Mitchell Crusto from the Loyola University um, New Orleans School of Law. Now, unfortunately, due to personal circumstances, both Professors Chandler and Crusto were unable to be here today in person, but they will be joining us um, virtually through the magic of Zoom, or at least everyone keep your fingers crossed that the technology works and that we will be able to see them and hear them both here in the room and online. Um, so with that, let me turn to our first speaker, Professor Chandler. Uh, hi, folks. Hopefully uh, you can uh, see me and hopefully you can see my uh, slides. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the law here. And let me just make sure everyone understands that these views are my own. They don't necessarily reflect those of the University of Houston. And also that due to time compression, I am skipping a lot in 50 of affirmative action law. So let's start with the Equal Protection Clause, which is where this all begins. And it states, nor shall any state deny to any persons within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. You'll notice the use of the word state there as opposed to the federal government. There's no Equal Protection Clause explicitly baked into the regular Constitution, but the Supreme Court in a series of cases since the 1950s has interpreted the Fifth Amendment Due Process Clause to read as if it contained a, what has now been construed as an identical equal protection component. You'll also notice that the Equal Protection Clause does not say, nor shall any private business or private educational institution deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And so you might be wondering, well, then how does this apply to places like Harvard or other private institutions? And the answer is that it does so indirectly through, among other things, Section 601 of the Civil Rights Act, which states that if you're getting any federal money, as Harvard certainly is, then you cannot uh, exclude a person from participation on the basis of race, color, or national origin. All right, so one of the difficulties in thinking about affirmative action is the sort of disconnect between what many people might think are the strongest rationales for race-based affirmative action and what the Supreme Court has accepted. Uh, and here are some rationales. One is specific compensation, basically, that the institution in the past discriminated against some race or ethnic group and therefore now wishes to uh, re reverse that. And that is actually permissible where you can show fairly recent discrimination on the part of the institution. But that generally isn't the case for a lot of places these days. And so the second rationale that's often advanced is sort of a general compensation rationale that we learned from the prior panel about various forms of what you might think of as ambient social and racial discrimination that work to the disadvantage of uh, many people and that, that correlates with race. Uh, is that a, a basis for affirmative action? And the answer is I'll talk about that the Supreme Court has said, no, it is not because in the process, it's a zero sum game to some extent into the process that you are elevating one group, you are hurting others who are thought to be innocent in, in the ambient social discrimination. A third rationale is um, a utilitarian one. And uh, this is one where, for example, diversity 
uh, as some of the previous panelists pointed out, can sometimes lead uh, directly or indirectly to improvement of a product or a service or an educational experience. And as we'll talk about, the Supreme Court has to some extent accepted that, although the recent SFFA case certainly limits the extent to which hazy claims of utilitarian advantage can be accepted as a compelling governmental interest. Um, the other issue is, can one consider discrimination by a majority in favor of historically oppressed racial groups as being different from uh, discrimination against historically oppressed racial groups? And the answer that the Supreme Court has provided in a number of cases is no, that you have to be symmetric and that race discrimination is race discrimination regardless of uh, who is the victim of it and who is the uh, proponent of it. So let's start. Historically, the first major case is Regents of the University of California versus Baki. Uh, there, UC Davis had a very simple idea to increase um, racial, uh, greater participation of race minorities in medical school. And that is that they create a certain number of slots to which only minorities could apply and the best minorities that applied would get in. Minorities could also get in through the regular process, but they felt that that was not getting them an adequately diverse group. And so they created basically a quota, uh, a special pathway for minority students. And Mr. Baki, although he did quite well on various objective factors relative to the people who had gotten in through these special uh, committees, nonetheless was not admitted. Mr. Baki wasn't too happy about that. And so therefore he brought a lawsuit. Uh, there was no quite majority opinion in Baki, but nonetheless, the Supreme Court seems to have rejected the idea that equal protection should apply asymmetrically. That is that it should work to the advantage of minorities, but uh, could, not be could not be used when majority groups were hurt by race discrimination. Uh, the court found that strict scrutiny should apply to instances of race discrimination in higher education, meaning that's sort of a code word that lawyers use. What does that mean? It means that the government has to have a compelling interest to support racial classification. For those of you who like Bayesian statistics, you can think of the prior as being that really race should not matter. And so therefore, in order to overcome that uh, prior, you need very strong evidence that in a particular instance, uh, you, you need to use racial classification to achieve some interest. And finally, you need to show that the interest can't be served easily by alternative mechanisms. That's sometimes described as narrow tailoring. At Davis, there was no history of race discrimination and the court rejected the idea that white people shared some sort of collective inherent responsibility for the difficulties that minorities were still encountering in 1970s California in uh, getting access to medical school. And so I would say the key intellectual move of Baki was to embrace this idea of symmetry in understanding the Equal Protection Clause. There are still many, many people who think that was a bad move, but that's what they did. And um, that you can't use race at a later stage, like med school admissions, to fix problems that may arise from sort of ambient use of race and race discrimination at an earlier phase. Uh, rather, if you want to address those you've, earlier things, you've got to do so directly. Although there are lots of Supreme Court cases that I've listed below, both uh, based on the federal constitution and based on state constitutions that are going to make it challenging for the government to address race discrimination at an earlier stage. Um, the court did, however, accept a utilitarian rationale for uh, affirmative action programs. It said it may be assumed that in some situations, a state interest in facilitating the health care of its citizens is sufficiently compelling to support use of a, sub a suspect classification, but it didn't find any evidence at the time that the quota system that was used by UC Davis really accomplish that. Moreover, there's still a question as to whether you really need to use race, supposing that you needed uh, uh, the, the, that you needed greater service uh, in the medical profession in impoverished and perhaps racial minority areas of the state. 
Uh, do you need to use race? Can you use race as a proxy for saying, well, this person's uh, Latino, they're more likely to go into a Latino community. And it wasn't clear because there are more direct ways perhaps of assessing that, like just asking the person, is that something that you're committed to doing? All right. Uh, Justice Powell, however, in his concurrence comes up with another utilitarian justification, which is diversity of the student body. And, you know, sort of cynically, uh, the reason that uh, affirmative action got somewhat approved in uh, Baki is that it would actually help white people. Um, and that it, uh, bringing in people with diverse perspectives, such as minorities, would actually make for a better medical education for all. And Justice Powell was deferential in uh, assessing university admissions policy, although not the one that, that UC Davis employed, which was a rather crude quota system. You have a dissent from Justice Brennan in which he found that they're uh, overcoming the chronic minority underrepresentation in medical school was sufficiently important to use race as a basis for uh, alleviating that, but that was a dissent. And moreover, Justice Brennan was willing to focus on sort of the general problem of discrimination in society rather than focusing narrowly on what was going on at UC Davis. Um, so that's the uh, Baki case on higher education. Skipping over a lot, uh, it's important to understand that the court has treated historically race discrimination in higher education as special, and that in other fields, they are even less accepting of affirmative race-based affirmative action. The lead case here is Pena, uh, which involved a federal program that gave preference to contractors who employed minority subcontractors in getting federal contracts for things like highway construction. Um, the court in Adirond rejects the idea that, well, maybe federal affirmative action programs should be judged differently than state affirmative action programs, and it didn't find any compelling governmental interest in equalizing opportunities in the trades for minorities, so that the fact that there were apparently lots of white guardrail construction companies and not so many minority ones didn't mean that the government could give preference to a, a new minority guardrail construction company. And so when you take out the utilitarian rationale that you saw accepted in theory in Baki, it becomes very hard under Supreme Court law to sustain racial preference. That takes us to Gratz versus Bollinger, a University of Michigan case in which they didn't use a quota, but they did use a somewhat mechanistic system in which things like under uh, high school GPA and, and uh, SAT score or ACT score uh, were supplemented by personal characteristics, but perhaps because Michigan has gazillions of applications, they did so algorithmically. If you were really the world's greatest teen cellist, you could get a maximum of five points for that on your score, but you would automatically be accorded 20 points for being a member of a minority group. The court disapproves of this algorithmic scheme, six to three. It's a little bit unclear exactly what was the fatal flaw. Was it the use of an algorithm? Was it the use of a point system for non-racial things that saturated at five? Was it the automatic use of race? But in any event, a majority of the Supreme Court disapproves of this algorithmic system, but Grutter versus Bollinger, also about the University of Michigan, but the law school is more perhaps savvy as to what Matt might pass muster, and they use race holistically, meaning, uh, I mean, there's a question as what does holistic mean, but they didn't have any published algorithm, and it was sort of all fuzzy that race could be considered along with a host of other factors, and it would be all individually taken into consideration. The court in Grutter accepts Justice Powell's utilitarian diversity rationale and that it would benefit all races if there were a greater uh, diverse viewpoints and viewpoint is correlated with race. But they do add this little thing, um, which uh, many lawyers might have thought was just dicta rather than a holding. Uh, and they said that we expect that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary to further the interest approved today. And so the clock is arguably ticking in 2003 on race-based affirmative action programs, even those that were holistic.
Um, what this does, of course, is there develops a, an industry of holistic admissions because uh, it makes it kind of fuzzy. The Supreme Court seems to have endorsed it. And therefore, you get a lot of schools, including uh, the University of Houston Law Center, that uses holistic admissions practices. Um, by as we enter into more recent times, I would say the Grutter regime is beginning to look vulnerable. Many of the justices who had signed on to Grutter were gone. Some of them had been replaced by uh, more conservative justices. You have the 25 year language of Grutter and the clicking top, clicky, ticking clock, not the clicking top. Um, you have Chief Justice Roberts, who's the Chief Justice, who you know uh, has been pretty clear about affirmative action. I think his pithiest statement on it is the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Uh, moreover, there's sort of an intellectual development that's occurring where people, more people are sort of accepting, including people on the left, that these racial categories are kind of pretty arbitrary and that they may not be granular or en enough to really capture what's going on. Like, you know, the Asian group equally captures the wealthy person from uh, originally from South Korea or Japan and lumps them together with the person from Malaysia or the Hmong refugee um, or the Latino categories capture everyone from the Argentinian Jew to the upper class Mexican to the mostly indigenous person from El Salvador. And there's a question as to whether that really makes sense in the 2020s. So that takes us to Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard in which two cases are consolidated, the Harvard case, which involved Title VI, since they're a private school, and the University of North Carolina case, which involves a public institution. Um, Harvard had an, a, a race-based affirmative action program. Uh, it quite explicitly did take race into account. Um, and the result, uh, Asians were not included within those who would benefit from this program, and therefore Asians were disadvantaged relative to what would have been the case had race not been taken into account. Uh, the federal district court who hears this upholds the Harvard policy, the First Circuit affirms. Um, at the UNC, uh, I would describe what they had as a very typical pre-SFFA uh, affirmative action program that kind of looked like Bruder. It was holistic. It didn't mean that you automatically got in by any means if you were a minority member, but statistically, it definitely seemed to be a plus and it was fine to consider race. Again, uh, federal district court upholds it and the Supreme Court just can't resist and reaches out and grants certiorari before judgment. Both cases are brought by the Students for Fair uh, Admissions I'm going to get them wrong. SFFA. It's, it's, it's a uh, private interest, uh, a, a, a conservative public interest group that doesn't believe in race-based affirmative action. All right. So what happens in both the uh, Harvard case and the UNC case, uh, SFA, SFFA wins. Uh, the vote is only different because Justice Jackson recused herself in the UNC, I'm sorry, in the SFFA, in the Harvard case. Um, and uh, you get Chief Justice Roberts, the longtime opponent of um, uh, affirmative action, uh, certainly writing opinions. Um, and so what do they say? Um, they say, look, race-based affirmative action programs in higher education must really, really meet strict scrutiny. And the sort of amorphous diversity goals we accept in Grutter, we're a little more skeptical about that. Uh, Justice Thomas reads this and says that Grutter is effectively overruled. Um, the court assumes, sort of without deciding it, that Title VI's standard is the same as uh, the Equal Protection Clause standard. There might possibly be some room for litigation there. Um, I would say the, the key thing that it does is it says, look, schools cannot take race explicitly into account in uh, admitting students. Uh, but they can take it indirectly into account insofar as it can be shown in an individual case, not as a result of generalization and stereotypes, that race either resulted in hardship or it created particular forms of inspiration. The court, I suppose, is worried that crafty admissions officers will take this little 
uh, ability to use race into account and basically uh, use the black box of the admissions process as a way of restoring the pre-SFF FA regime, and the court warns that this consideration must be individuated and that you can't just use that exception to recreate the regime that they just held to be unlawful. Whether that warning is going to be actually heeded and detectable remains to be seen. So what's the after picture with respect to affirmative action? Um, Pure race-based affirmative action is not okay, even if there is racial discrimination floating about. You can't use race in formulaic ways. Um, we're not going to give that much deference to university assessments that racial diversity improves education. And we're not, except outside of the military academies, say that the state has a compelling governmental interest in producing racially diverse leadership. But race can be used indirectly. It can contextualize other student achievements, and you can also track it to make sure that, in fact, there is no race discrimination going on. There remains footnote four, which some people think applies not just to military academies, but maybe it could apply to uh, med schools or law schools. Also, um, I will say editorializing here, I think that's a very dubious argument because Harvard lost, and Harvard is a school that prides itself on producing leaders for the world, and yet the Supreme Court was not willing to embrace that as a reason for Harvard exceptionalism. But there is a military case that is percolating through uh, the court system that may be brought. So I will stop there. You can't hear me. Let me. Okay, we're good. Go ahead. I think it was technology. Good All right. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, nice. <laughs> I can hear myself better too. Um, thanks so much to the organizers, uh, my fellow panelists, um, and all of you for the chance to learn from you and engage with you on uh, the critical topics of this conference. Um, so just to kind of uh, put uh, perhaps a sharp edge on uh, some of what uh, has already been said from a legal perspective. Um, as some of you may know, uh, conservative legal organizations have set their sights not just on ending uh, affirmative action in university admissions, but um, more generally on most, if not all, programs intended to achieve better access, representation, and racial equality generally. Um, those organizations are well resourced and they are multiplying um, and they're putting a lot of resources into specifically going into court to block uh, these kinds of initiatives. So, for example, from the law context recently a number of major law firms announced that they would end their programs uh, directed at hiring and training minority law students as future associates after being sued or threatened with suit by another um, organization, coincidentally, uh, like Students for Fair Admissions, also founded by Edward Blum, uh, who I believe is, in, is from Texas. Some of you may know his history well. Um, from Houston, right, right. Um, interesting, interesting history as well, but I, I, I won't go into that tangent. So this uh, other organization, the American Alliance for Equal Rights, um, had sued or threatened suit um, against at least seven law firms, and uh, that those actions in fact bore fruit for them as those law firms have now redesigned those programs to no longer be race conscious, but rather to be open uh, to all applicants. Uh, so the challenge across the board, it, uh, again, from this legal perspective, um, is whether any race-based programs intended to diversify the legal profession, the medical profession, uh, or any other field can survive. And to the extent that the prognosis is poor for that in the long term, the next question is whether programs that aim to achieve diversity by proxy will be effective enough insofar as they rely on criteria like income, geography, first generation status, or other socioeconomic variables. Um, but do know that in fact conservatives are also targeting those kinds of programs as well on the grounds that the goal of curing underrepresentation inevitably hurts other groups, i.e. those that are overrepresented and is therefore racially discriminatory. 
I was. I recently uh, uh, heard a conservative lawyer and former administrative official publicly argue that the government should not even be collecting racial data, as that inevitably leads to discrimination. On his argument, um, so be aware that the end goal for at least some in the conservative legal movement is to halt all ability to track racial outcomes or attempt to achieve different ones in any uh, conscious way. They truly seek colorblindness in an absolute sense, and they have been winning legal victories in some, though definitely not all courts. The question, which is not answerable based on doctrine or constitutional text, is whether the federal courts will swing uh, so far in uh, the rightward direction as to adopt absolute colorblindness as the dominant legal interpretation. Uh, with that backdrop and uh, remaining in the present legal moment, assuming that the state of the law does not shift that far, I want to use the rest of my time to talk about some older case law um, and the possibility of going forward based on, on some of that case law in the present moment. Um, as Professor Chandler discussed, the key in determining whether race-based programs will survive when challenged under the Equal Protection Clause or Title VI, which applies to private institutions that take federal money, uh, is whether the institution can show that they are necessary to serve a compelling interest. The problem, as you may have gleaned from, from his presentation, is that no one knows ex ante what a compelling interest uh, is, uh, and we have no guidelines for determining whether something is compelling from the case law. We simply know that the court has only approved three thus far, has rejected various others, and of those three, seems to have largely discarded one of them in Students for Fair Admissions. Uh, as Professor uh, uh, Chandler discussed um, and Dean Williams also mentioned, Students for Fair Admissions, uh, that decision did not explicitly say that achieving the educational benefits of holistic diversity um, in the university context would never be a compelling government interest, but the criteria it sets forth seem impossible to satisfy as a practical matter. Uh, so for the court, that leaves potentially only two compelling interests, uh, at least that have been approved, that allow public institutions to use racial or federally funded institutions to use racial classifications, remediating aiding, uh, past discrimination by the institution in question, as was done, for example, in school desegregation orders that in fact did uh, assign students by race to schools, among other remedial steps, um, and in staving off uh, emergencies like prison riots. Theoretically, other interests might remain on the table. As this conference has been outlined, one potential justification would rest on the idea of training diverse medical and legal professionals in order to serve the entire American public and to minimize the stark racial inequalities in healthcare and legal access, um, as well as in medical and legal outcomes that we currently see. But do the courts believe that those are compelling interests? Um, and could they be convinced to rule that in fact, um, admitting and training more Black, Latinx, uh, um, Native, and other minority students will have a robust and direct uh, relationship to those goals of improving racial disparities in health, law, and other fields. Um, Justice Powell in Bonke acknowledged uh, in, a, in a kind of what some have deemed a throwaway passage, that there might be a compelling government interest in providing medical care to underserved communities. The question he raised, however, was whether evidence could be mustered uh, to show that training minority doctors had a robust and direct relationship to serving those communities. According to Powell, the evidence before the court in Baki was insufficient on the record before them to bear out that claim. So Baki leaves open, and the court has never technically ruled to the contrary, that there may be a compelling interest in serving the disadvantaged that could justify uh, race-conscious admissions if there were empirical evidence showing that such a program actually served that goal. That possibility has been left largely dormant um, as a justification for such programs for the last 46 years since Baki likely because Justice Powell provided a more direct and simple route to justifying affirmative action by sketching out that famous diversity rationale. Um, but nonetheless, in the lower courts, uh, there is uh, a not very well developed but real history of accepting one uh, kind of distinctive justification for race-based <coughs> classifications, which directly supports the concept of using affirmative action to better serve minority communities. 
uh, several federal appellate decisions in the late 1990s and early aughts accepted the idea that police departments could have compelling operational needs in achieving diverse police forces, and that this would justify race-based hiring or promotion criteria. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit led the way, and thus, for example, in a 2003 decision, uh, that court held that the Chicago Police Department had proven its need for a diverse police department and that that need was compelling. The CPD had presented expert police had presented expert testimony from academics and police chiefs, as well as uh, the CPD's own leadership, which um, indicated the need for minority officers to improve public perceptions, which in turn improved the department's detection and resolution of crimes, as well as internal attitudes on the force. They testified that such diversity, quote, not only improved police community cooperation, but also diffused potentially explosive situations of community racial tension and unrest. In some other situations, uh, federal courts didn't, um, acknowledge, essentially acknowledged the rationale and its potential uh, legitimacy, but held in those cases that other departments had failed to present sufficient evidence of the need and effectiveness um, of a diverse set of officers in directly uh, serving that need. Um, so there are some inherent limits to building on that case law in the present because it was developed in a period when the courts in fact accepted uh, the, the related diversity rationale in the university context based on Baki. Um, yet these are cases that have not been overruled and certain aspects of that line of cases um, have, have some promise in the present. Um, and there are, of course, as you can imagine um, from my tone thus far, there are also reasons to be pessimistic, I regret to say. Um, so to begin with the promise, we've come some distance since the aughts, and we may be able to substantiate the kinds of interests at stake um, more cleanly now than, for example, some of those failing uh, attempts by police departments, um, how those fared then. Uh, so social science has markedly improved um, even in the years since then. <laughs> Academics have the capacity to offer much more refined empirical analyses and better data to support claims that training diverse professionals directly links to better serving diverse communities. Um, as several of the prior speakers demonstrated, um, and again, as, as Dean Williams pointed out, uh, the medical field has made um, significant progress in building out that kind of evidence, while the legal field has much sparse, sparser progress to show. Um, as, as was mentioned, um, there, there are a, a scattering of studies that have offered some, for example, initial evidence uh, that racial bias um, affects Black people's access to lawyers in, in one particular study, um, and, that, uh, and that the lack of sufficient minority um, uh, lawyers also um, impacts relationships with their lawyers. Further, there's some empirical evidence, um, more mixed than, than one might hope if you work in law schools, uh, that lacking access to lawyers uh, leads to worse outcomes in at least some contexts. Those studies are not numerous, and there is significant work to do in fleshing them out. So while there's obviously potential to build that rigorous empirical evidence supporting the claim that affirmative action is needed to address stark racial inequalities in the professional services offered to people of color, we have a lot of research to do, at least in law, and I would anticipate in other professional fields and disciplines. Another ish underlying issue is that Baki in that passage um, addressing that, that goal um, pointed out, Justice Powell pointed out that uh, training more minority doctors would not directly ensure that they would go on to work with um, what was described as underserved patients in um, as to whether they would uh, serve uh, minority patients. Well, of course, on net increasing the diversity of the field increases the likelihood that, for example, um, black people can visit black doctors and other professionals. It doesn't assure it if the goal is considered compelling, in part because it also serves the goal of not just serving middle class and well resourced uh, minority <laughs> communities, then institutions might actually have to structure in assurances that some of the people trained will go on to serve as doctors to poor people or other underserved groups, whether by creating fellowships with such requirements um, or otherwise which would require you know, this fleshing out of institutional design to convince the court that the programs in question are actually ensuring that diverse doctors serve patients and diverse lawyers serve clients who need them most. 
Um, that design, of course, introduced hard questions because it might constrain uh, minority professionals and their career choices when they emerge from training in ways that could appear to be an unfair and disparate burden for them to bear. The biggest doubts, again, from a legal perspective, however, come out of SFA itself. The logic of the opinion indicates that there are six justices on this court who see constitutional flaws in any program that they think treats, in their words, quote, race as a negative. If, if they believe that we're in a zero sum admissions context, their logic and discussion suggests that anytime we use individualized racial classifications um, in any selection process, we'll be improving some groups outcomes and necessarily diminishing others. Those case um, SSFA and earlier case law also expressed the need for an endpoint. So in an earlier case, Wigand v. Jackson Board of Education, a Michigan school board had argued that minority teachers were needed as role models for minorities' children and um, sort of pinned that target to the proportion of minority students in the population. Justice Powell wrote there that such a program had no logical stopping point and that made it unacceptable as a matter of strict scrutiny. So if this concern with zero-sum context and the lack of an endpoint are taken seriously, SSFA itself makes affirmative action impossible in many, perhaps almost all settings, even though the court was so careful not to explicitly overturn its affirmative action jurisprudence. To close, I, I just want to point out that the ultimate way to change those constitutional barriers is necessarily to change the court. Better empirical evidence and institutional design can only go so far in persuading those committed to colorblindness. Um, the answer ultimately lies in changing politics. Um, we have a lot of work um, for those who uh, believe in these goals to shift the conversation and ultimately shift electoral outcomes in ways that lead to presidents that nominate and senators that confirm justices who understand the Constitution to allow institutions to actively address and repair racial inequality. Thanks. Well, thank you. Um, I guess I, I'm going to be the contrarian in today's event, but hopefully through that dialogue will um, help us in kind of figuring out where do we move going forward uh, after the Students for Fair Admissions case. I'll start with a little bit about my background and how I got involved. Um, you know, I was born and raised in Austin, Texas. My parents are from China. Um, they grew up under communism and saw some of the worst of what happened over there, people literally starving to death, um, the Cultural Revolution, uh, teachers being beaten, universities shut down. My dad, after graduating high school, was sent to the countryside to do uh, manual labor because you're supposed to learn from the workers. Schools were closed. Um, when Mao died, the schools reopened, and that's how he pursued higher education, um, had a chance to study abroad in Germany and do a postdoc at UT, um, which is how our family got here. Um, after the massacre in Beijing in 89, the uh, Chinese immigrants uh, got green cards, and so many of them were able to stay in the US that way. Um, when it came time to apply to college, you know, I, you'd hear the rhetoric of wanting to get to know you as an individual, look at evidence of disadvantage. I'd say certainly I, I felt, you know, as someone who'd, who'd been disadvantaged in the sense that just being, you know, the immigrant experience, speaking a different language at home versus out at school, um, you know, being teased by kids on the playground, whatever about underrepresentation. I think, you know, when you're one of the various minority groups that are more in the single digits or even lower, you're pretty much used to uh, no representation anywhere, right? Um, just, you're just you're the only one. Um, and yet, you know, it, it also seemed that when you hear about, well, we want to get certain composition of our class, you know, underrepresented minority groups, it seemed like they were beating around the bush, but basically, you know, we can't have too many Asians if they happen to be disproportionately doing too well on exams, that would be a problem. I think Harvard in particular, because of how elite it is, um, and it's applicants coming from some of the most competitive, had a disproportionate number of Asians who would have been those most competitive applicants. And so you don't get your class to look the right way from their perspective without basically treating Asians even much worse than a lot of white applicants. I think that probably was the reason why Harvard did lose, or one of the, the big reasons why this came out different than Fisher, 
Um, and, you know, I, I was listening to Adam Mortara, who was one of the trial lawyers in the Harvard case, and he said, I never really thought much about this issue before I was asked to try the case, because I kind of figured, you know, white applicants, I mean, whatever, the, the, whatever alleged harm is kind of distributed pretty broadly among a lot of people in the population and just wasn't a big deal to me. But then when I took that jump and decided to accept the case, I looked at the evidence and it was heartbreaking to me, like what Harvard was doing. It was really a disservice to Asian Americans and, and they weren't being honest about it. They just wouldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't say the truth because it would just be too hurtful. Um, and, and I think that's a sign, you, you know, when you don't want people to see what you're doing, you can't be transparent about it, that maybe you know that there's something wrong with it. Um, so I think Harvard needed to lose, they deserve to lose. I mean, Harvard, I, I've been thinking about this ever since I applied to college and I, it just kept bothering me. And I, I would go to you know, events like this and try to have a dialogue. And I think the response was usually just like, sit down and shut up. I remember in 2014, I was a, a law student at Harvard, Professor Randall Kennedy, who I respect a great deal. He's a strong defender of affirmative action. African-American would describe himself as a beneficiary, but is very willing to continuously do these events, even as the law has changed you know, in a way that he doesn't like, um, to, to really engage with the other side and, and do so in an honest way, not politically. But there was this young Asian-American student who went up uh, to ask him, well, basically what I just kind of told you about Asians, do they have a claim to be you know, disadvantaged? And he pretty much just said, no, and that's kind of ended it. I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity myself to do one of these events with him as well. And I kind of maybe more exquisitely, since it was just the two of us on the panel kind of went into it the way I have now. And he kind of said, look, I understand your perspective. Um, I, I guess you know, Asian Americans are kind of in some sense collateral damage in all this. And I think that was uh, an apt term in the sense that if you think of, you know, was it right for the US to drop the atomic bomb, right? There were innocent people who died. And I think the only way you could make that make sense is if you thought there was some, something else that was being served that you could justify so many people dying, which would be obviously just even, you know, many times more people dying and much more suffering that would have had to have been prevented, right? So I, I, I think that's, that to me makes more sense than a lot of the diversity rationales that have been offered um, in terms of how colleges were, were using these policies in particular. Um, and I suppose that's the kind of trade-off, right? I mean, and that's, the, I think that's the, going forward, how do schools, how do institutions operate? I think you need to be able to, when that person comes forward and they're articulating some sense of grievance, right? To actually look at them and kind of take them seriously, listen to them, negotiate. What, where do we kind of meet halfway as opposed to just sit down, you know, be quiet. Um, I think that's, I mean, if you think of how, how civil litigation works, you know, you sue someone, most cases get settled. It's like, look, we're, we're fighting, it's costing us money, we're tired and we're stressed out, let's kind of meet in the middle. I think Harvard just wouldn't, they wouldn't budge, and so they took it all the way to the Supreme Court and they lost. Um, I think we've heard a lot of good scholarship and, and thoughts on the value diversity can add. And I, I suppose, yeah, and you know, this is where you talk about the conservatives, right? There, there are a lot of different people with different perspectives. Um, I'm not sure necessarily all of the people I've known kind of who, who I've worked with on these issues um, would agree with what I'm saying. But I, I do think there is, you know, it just, there are undeniably, I, I don't think we can ever like colorblind, be colorblind in the sense like pretend, we just pretend like it doesn't matter and then it doesn't matter. It's always there, it's hovering in the back, uh, in the background. And I think um, Chief Justice Roberts, if you noticed in the last paragraph of the SFFA opinion did acknowledge a difference between which racial box you check, which you would describe as stereotyping and actually getting to know who someone is as an individual. Um, and he said, well, look, if, you're, if, you're, if who you are as an individual is certainly a part of that is your race um, and you consider that, that's okay. Um, and in a way, you could say that's what Grutter was trying to, that, that's what they were articulating. But I think in practice, because university admissions is so large scale, you, you have to kind of sort people into these rough categories um, and, and sort of, you're not really getting to know people as individual, right? You've got roughly the same kind of criteria that you're looking at for everyone and certain boxes are being filled. Um, and, and so that's how it was operating. Um, so I, I, but to the point that I was saying earlier, I, I, I understand that I think whether it's like in medicine, Right, the different interactions people have with um, trust, um, the ability to have you know a doctor who uh, understands like your life experience. Um, I, I don't think we can deny that that's um, that's a reality. I, I think the lesson to take away from the case, and if you think about how to, how do we go forward and still achieve some of the objectives we want to achieve, is 
that just because you say I'm, I'm doing this for diversity doesn't mean what you're doing is actually the right thing. I mean, this is, I guess, what you'd say is the means to end fit. You could say diversity and then be, be doing, you know, many, uh, uh, there's a diverse number of things that people claim are related to diversity, and some may be, you know, better designed than others, and some may just be totally clumsy and make no sense that even most, uh, most people would, you know, in this room who, who support diversity initiatives would say, well, that, that wasn't a really great idea. So the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals is about to hear a case. They, they're hear, rehearing it on banc, so the entire Fifth Circuit's going to hear it involving this corporate board diversity rule and essentially nasdaq has this rule that is you have to explain whether you have one board member on your company listed on nasdaq who is a woman if not you need to explain why and you must have another board member that's either a racial minority or lgbtq and if not explain why i filed a brief in that case saying why did you group racial minorities and lgbtq under one single board slot. So if you have a white bisexual man, that somehow you've checked your box and satisfied, you know, what, what you were trying to accomplish versus say a, mi a minority man, right? That, it's obviously inexplicable. There may be pragmatic reasons that they would never articulate in court as to maybe it's too hard to get a minority. Maybe we didn't want to get sued for race discrimination, you know, maybe, right? But, but why did they make that calculus? So Professor Levinson from the University of Texas has an article on diversity where he he kind of just says, look, any diversity policy is eventually going to prioritize some people over others. The way when we did one of our events at UT, he described it was in that context was I'd like to see more Middle Eastern students, but we don't, you know, realistically, that's just not how UT is approaching it. I actually put that in my amicus brief that I filed in the Harvard case. And if you remember, that came up an oral argument, which was, what does somebody who's Middle Eastern, what box do they even check? The lawyer couldn't answer. I think most sort of under the conventional census categories, it would be someone who was white. They'd be classified as white. I think I actually I think very recently the federal government's about to address that probably because they I mean they realize it's absurd. I think a lot of Middle Eastern folks they don't like well, they're immigrants and they feel like they're you, you're lumping me together with white, um, the white category. But the, there's an infinite number of sort of arbitrary categories and judgments that go into this. And then, you know, which which groups are beneficiaries, which aren't. Would you even go so high resolution as to lump racial minorities and LGBTQ whites together into one diversity category, right? There's sort of these, these practical judgments. And I think what you're seeing is that some of these policies can have an effect of excluding people, right? If you're not the beneficiary um, and you see, or for instance, you, um, my co-panelist mentioned the law firm diversity fellowships, right? Where they explicitly, rather than saying we want to get we want to look at all aspects of diversity. They just said, this is a fellowship for X, Y, Z, which implicitly means if you're not, you don't check that box, you don't belong. And I think there's a judgment call being made that, yeah, but like that, I mean, even the, the law firms revised it themselves. Like they didn't try to defend that all the way up to the Supreme Court, right? I think they knew, okay, that wasn't the right way to do it. Um, so in crafting a policy, you know, I think it was, it was mentioned, it's been mentioned that there are still ways to try to pursue various of these goals um, and to achieve diversity and to look at all the different dimensions on which uh, there are inequities and disadvantages in society. Some of them racial and some of them also not necessarily racial and including you know, lower class whites, right? And in crafting our policies, you wanna be genuinely inclusive. You have to listen to that feedback. If someone is saying, I think what you're doing is whether in well-intentioned or not actually having an exclusionary effect on some people um, and rather than just saying sit down and shut up, whether it's because you're a bigot or you're, hey, you're disrupting our compromise, we've worked, we've worked it out and just, just go along with it to figure out how to include everyone in your policies. And I think that, you know, the, the, as any lawyer will tell you, you have to have standing to sue, which means you have to find a plaintiff, someone who feels sufficiently aggrieved that they're going to bother to go to court, articulate a story about what this policy did to hurt that person. And the judge or the jury has to find it sufficiently compelling to bother to, to go through you know, the, the legal process, not to dismiss the case, and to ultimately explain why that person should win. Um, and that depends on the facts of the case. So I think if you've crafted a, 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 a genuinely inclusive policy, you're not going to have a plaintiff who's going to have standing. Or if they did try to sue, the story wouldn't, they would have a hard time telling a story that got you know, very much traction. Um, and I think that, that's part of the feedback process that you should include in terms of crafting a diversity policy. Okay, so we're going to turn up. Oh. <laughs>
We're going to um, turn online now to our final speaker, uh, Mitchell. When you're ready. Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone uh, for being here, uh, the audience, uh, whether they're here in person or virtually. I want to thank my panelists um, for your presentations and also particularly Professor Mantel uh, and Dean Len uh, Baines, who helped um, uh, make, make this happen. So uh, not unlike my other speakers, we have a lot to say and not a lot of time to say it. Uh, I did prepare a handout which I think has been posted and maybe hand out in person. Uh, I'm going to deviate from it so I can uh, be uh, brief and more uh, to the point. Uh, so just to be clear, uh, my presentation is uh, as an advocate for underrepresented racial minorities. Uh, so that um, if it seems a little bit, um, you know, kind of uh, biased, um, it's not because I don't recognize the, the interests of others, uh, including the Asian American community and other uh, underrepresented communities, but I am concerned about the impact uh, that the FSA is, is going to have on the future of underrepresented racial minorities, particularly African Americans, Asian Americans, and uh, Native Americans, uh, relative to law school and medical school admission. So let me start with a little bit of context. Uh, Civil Rights Act, uh, 1964. Uh, basically uh, was the federal government's uh, attempt to uh, level the playing field uh, and to be um, a vehicle for anti-discrimination. Uh, that discrimination uh, against uh, Asian Americans, against uh, women, uh, against um, uh, Jewish um, citizens, um, African Americans, uh, Hispanic, it was basically against almost everyone who wasn't white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, which was basically what the most elite schools in this country uh, were basically uh, built uh, to uh, to support uh, with all the resources that came along with it. Uh, that Civil Rights Act uh, also um, resulted from the Civil Rights Movement, which anyone knows was a predominantly an African-American movement, but not exclusively. Uh, and with a lot of bloodshed, a lot of um, uh, things that went along with it, which you can kind of just check on, on your history. The outcome of it relative to education was, as was mentioned uh, by uh, Professor Chandler, uh, Title uh, VI, federal funds uh, would be um, denied uh, if equal access uh, was not given uh, to every person, regardless of race and color and, and the rest. And I'm gonna use the term parity because I think it's important for us to consider uh, equality in the sense of what might be considered parity and I'll define parity uh, as we kind of go along. And so at any rate, um, in the late 60s, um, the most elite schools, including Harvard and, and my alma mater, Yale uh, University, um, basically uh, opened its, its doors for the first time to any reasonable number of women, um, African-Americans, Hispanics, uh, Asians, um, uh, Jewish Americans, and, and the rest, uh, Native Americans. Uh, and, and so let me kind of give you a background on my story well, as, as to my benefit from the affirmative <laughs> movement. So in 1971, I was admitted into Yale. And uh, I think it may be, um, in my opinion, clear, but maybe not. <laughs> affirmative action did not mean that I got accepted because I was African-American. Uh, I got accepted because I was already qualified to be at Yale. Uh, prior to the Civil Rights Act, I would not have been accepted into Yale. Prior to the, to the Civil Rights Act, women would not have been um, admitted to Yale or very many Asians or uh, Jewish Americans or Latino Americans. Uh, I was accepted into Yale because I was highly qualified to be at Yale. And my achievements um, you know, at Yale, uh, graduating uh, magna cum laude, um, scholars at a house, which was limited up to 12 uh, students at the university, uh, my subsequent experiences being a Marshall Scholar at Oxford University um, in, uh, in England, uh, as well as a Yale Law School degree, and my subsequent achievements, not only me, but the thousands of affirmative action babies, as they might be called, uh, of all backgrounds who have proven themselves incredibly competent, uh, including um, a U.S. President and Barack Obama, our first female Vice President, two Supreme Court Justices, 
and countless doctors and lawyers and business leaders, and those are just of the African American community. If you look at the number of women who have benefited from affirmative action of all backgrounds, I mean, it's phenomenal. It really constitutes a, a revolution. And, and I want to kind of put an emphasis on that. The, the affirmative action slash diversity movement has really been a, a revolution in American education. If you look, at, if you took a snapshot of Yale University uh, in the 19, early 1960s, it was all white males, uh, basically of, of Christian background. If you took a snapshot of Yale today, I mean, you would see an incredibly diverse uh, population, majority women, a great percentage of uh, Asians, uh, a significant number, but not enough of African-Americans and Latinos, still very few Native Americans in, uh, in the rest. Okay? Uh, so as a result of the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King's vision of a society where a person can be judged by the character and not by the color of their skin has become a reality uh, for most historically discriminated against people, including uh, women, Jewish people, Asians, and even uh, African-Americans, and, and that's it, not the next, but not so much for the latter. Uh, for, the, for example, for the African-American population, even with the affirmative action pre-SFFA, uh, um, there might have been less than 6% of the uh, enrollment at uh, most of the elite universities, less than 6%. African-Americans, even the African-Americans make up about 12% of the population. So again, a lack, a lack of parity. Let's take us to the actual Supreme Court decision. So this decision, and again, I think the past speakers and, and uh, Professor Milligan and Professor Chandler have done an adequate job in, in telling us what that decision basically said. So I'm not gonna kind of repeat that decision. I'm gonna criticize that decision uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, I think that this present Supreme Court is going to go down in history as one of the most conservative pro-white supremacists, pro-white male supremacy uh, courts that we have seen. It's going to see this particular decision, even though it looks really nice on paper, because it appears to be a pro-affirmative um, action decision and pro-Asian uh, American uh, anti-discrimination decision. Uh, if you look at the underpinnings of it, which is their interpretation of the 14th Amendment, it basically lays a foundation for anyone to sue, and this is going on now and will continue to go on, to basically erase the revolution that we've seen relative to diversity in education and in our society. And it's consistent with the Dobbs decision where the Supreme Court is basically trying to take control of white women and all women's um, bodies uh, now we're looking to take control of the minds of racial minorities by limiting their access to top educational institutions. Uh, at any rate, uh, beyond the uh, reasoning of the case or the uh, specific holding of the case, it's anti, uh, it's anti, uh, anti affirmative action rationale is having a chilling effect as you've already been identified. Uh, uh, Professor Milligan has uh, met, talked, to, uh, talked about it already a chilling effect on our society in general that any program that seeks to benefit uh, underrepresented racial minorities is being uh, seen as being unconstitutional, unfavorable. So let me tell you why I think the Supreme Court is wrong and, and, and is um, basically a white supremacist court. And I don't use that kind of lightly. First of all, it's a national ban on the use of race. Uh, even in the Dobbs case, the court basically recognized his past history of, rec of, of using federalism as an approach to, to governing. Uh, this is not a uh, federalist uh, decision. Uh, this is basically a uh, take it or leave it, uh, public and private uh, dicta, uh, total national ban, uh, which is quite frankly anti-federalist, number one. Number two, it is anti-majoritarian. The majority of states recognize and have, have embraced the use of race uh, in a limited manner in education to promote uh, the goal of diversity in education. The majority of states, the Supreme Court has basically ignored the majority of states and gone with a, with a, a few states, about 10 states, in saying that uh, you cannot use race. Uh, so the court has been uh, anti-federalist, has been anti-majoritarian, uh, very dictatorial in its, in its approach unprecedented in our recent history that a court would do that even for a conservative court. Okay, most importantly is the negative impact that this case is gonna have on 
uh, African American uh, enrollment and Latinx enrollment and Native American enrollment in law schools and medical schools. First of all, one of the benefits of my having gone to Yale is that it certifies my uh, credentials as a uh, educated, highly educated, highly competent person. Uh, I would not have gotten into Yale Law School had I not uh, attended Yale undergraduate. And even in Yale Law School, I had naysayers who thought that I was at Yale Law School because I was a part of affirmative action, not because I was a highly qualified person who happened to be African-American. If we don't have a pipeline or a pathway uh, of highly qualified uh, underrepresented racial minorities at the undergraduate level, you're not gonna see them being accepted by the law schools and medical schools because they're gonna basically be seen as less qualified. And so it's very important that we uh, make sure that um, these underrepresented racial minorities uh, are accepted in our most uh, prestigious elite resource uh, rich uh, universities uh, in this country. Uh, so the negative impact, which is going to happen, I mean, I think it's already, you know, kind of in in the in the picture. I mean, it it, it is clear that the Supreme Court is sided with the <clears throat> diversity uh, movement in this country, and uh, there's very little I think that we can do uh, legally in that regard. The Fifth Circuit is highly conservative. I I clear for Judge John Minor Wisdom, who was a champion of civil rights. Uh, the present Supreme Court, I mean, Judge Wisdom would be rolling over in his grave if he saw the present composition of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals of what it's going to do relative to, to racial equality. So that leaves us with the Congress, and the Congress, unfortunately, is not going to do much on, on affirmative action. Um, the president, the executive, has uh, issued um, guidelines. The Department of Education has, has issued guidelines that you should take a look at is how to uh, interpret um, the SFFA case uh, in, in a limited way, uh, in the ways that will still allow for uh, racial diversity. Um, I think also state laws, we shouldn't kind of give up the fight, just as we are seeing in the abortion issue relative to Dobbs, there st still could be state movements uh, in, in terms of pro-diversity at the state level. Uh, footnote four talks about exceptions for military. I have written an essay. I think there's also an opportunity for faith-based organizations, faith-based universities to play a role. Uh, this court has been very in favor of, of uh, faith, uh, religious-based liberties. I think that the faith-based faith organizations like uh, the Jesuit schools around the country, um, one out of 10 um, lawyers have been educated by um, a Jesuit uh, law school. And I think that if those schools were serious about uh, equality, racial equality, that they would step up uh, and seek an exception based on faith-based, um, their faith-based mission. Uh, and then one last uh, idea, because I'm going to run out of time and I'm very interested in the questions of the audience, as we all are, uh, alternatives to our admissions process. Uh, we, we seem to think that standardized tests and, and, the, and the, the elite schools are move, move, moving back to standardized tests and GPAs are the only criteria to evaluate a person's ability and future um, benefits from, uh, from education. Uh, we did one thing at Loyola that I suggest you consider. We haven't done it in a while. It was a, an alternative uh, admissions process, uh, which was a summer uh, admit program. Uh, in that program, we took people who would not normally be accepted because of their entering credentials and basically in, in encouraged them and in, invited them to a summer program. And if in the summer program, they took three courses that we offered to them, and if they got two A's out of the three courses, they would be accepted into the law school. I think we need to find some alternatives to standardized tests and GPA. Those, those uh, alternatives would not be um, you know, there specifically to make sure that we had certain races, um, admit it, but it would basically be a more fair process, an alternative process uh, that might allow for underrepresented people of all backgrounds to have a chance beyond the usual standardized test scores and standardized uh, GPAs. I'm going to leave you with that. I'm uh, sorry for talking fast and uh, look the Q&A. Thank you very much. So we'll now turn to Q&A. So anyone that's in person should feel free to come up to the microphone. And anyone online, please um, put your questions in the Q&A. 
Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to get us started and kind of follow up on something that um, Professor Milligan said, you. where you mentioned that some of the conservative groups that were behind the SFA challenge um, are looking beyond universities' affirmative action policies. Um, so I want to give you all a hypothetical looking ahead to the next panel and their discussion of pathway pipeline programs that are meant to increase interest in going to medical school or law school among students from minority populations. So the hypothetical is that we have a university or maybe it's a state bar association or state medical association that has designed a pathway or pipeline program, but they don't simply target schools that may have a large number of low income students, but they specifically target schools that have um, you know, a, a large percentage of students coming from underrepresented populations. So maybe they target or pick these schools based on, let's say, race and ethnicity. So would those types of programs then be legally vulnerable under the SFA and, and other decisions? Can I start? Yep, go ahead. Professor so my Mark. answer is yes, that those would be vulnerable because the motivation for the selecting those schools is based on race rather than what one is directly trying to achieve, which is presumably greater service of uh, people in minority communities, which might be achieved by other mechanisms. Uh, and so we don't have the, quite the case yet where the, proc, the selection of the proxy is itself based on racial goals but I think the theory of SFFA is that those kind of intentional use of proxies for racial balancing is as problematic as the direct use of race. You still could use things that correlate with race, such as underrepresentation, such as, I'm sorry, poverty or lack of opportunity, educational opportunity. And if that happened, as long as your motivation wasn't directly to engage in racial balancing, I think it would likely be okay. But under the hypo that you articulated, Professor Mantel, you have one vote that says you can't do it. Under the law, whether it's right or wrong, that's a separate issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I guess I... I, I think it's a bit ambiguous on the case law. I think it's actually kind of just a prediction about where the courts will go, because I think that, you know, we have a spectrum of things that one can do with a variety of kind of levels of racial awareness and racial goals. Um, obviously, uh, SFFA is, and some prior cases have suggested that the first line concern that some of the more conservative and even centrist justices like Kennedy have is the labeling of individual students by race and that that kind of um, individualized race presents problems that kind of more wholesale considerations of race like the population of a, of a feeder school for the pipeline program um, or thinking about race as you draw, draw school attendance zones. Um, there's sort of a, a spectrum of these things. And again, as I kind of hinted at, I think that for those who are really um, aimed at getting rid of all of this, um, they would try to do away with all of it. I do think it's potentially, because it's still explicitly race-based, is gonna be one of the kind of first line targets after SFFA or program like that. I think I agree with what Professor Chandler said, which is, I mean, most obviously unlawful if you check certain boxes, you're eligible. If you don't, you're excluded. I mean, that, that's just clearly unlawful. You want to call it a quota, um, facially discriminatory, as the lawyers would say. And then I think then there's the question that Professor Chandler said, if it purports to be race neutral, but there are racial motivations, it turns on the facts of the case. Um, and, and that's basically how race discrimination is litigated everywhere in, in, in other domains. So I think it kind of depends on the extent to which um, it's actually trying to exclude people based on race, or, you know, it, it, it sort of looks at whatever generalized disadvantage of which is not distributed, you know, um, perfectly even right like across society, you know, that, that yeah, I, I think you're gonna put, put yourselves in the shoes of the person who might sue and like, what, what's the story they're gonna tell and then how do you explain to the court or to that person to their face of why you're doing things the way they are and if it's an answer they can find acceptable, I think you're probably, you know, in better shape in terms of 
not having a legal challenge versus um, if there's something about it that we, you kind of know deep down inside, if they really knew what we were doing, it wouldn't look too good. Um, you probably have a greater chance of litigation. Yeah, just quickly, because I know we have a lot of people looking to ask, ask questions. I agree, uh, this decision uh, is not the end point. Uh, the Fifth Circuit, for example, is gonna be even more conservative a Supreme Court relative to this opinion. We're gonna see those conservative opinions that were concurrent opinions in SFFA, including uh, Justice Thomas's opinion, be taken uh, and, and run with it, not just on race, but also uh, the same group that's um, kind of looking to have a colorblind society is also looking to have a, a gender blind society where they're challenging Title IX and other uh, uh, programs relative to women. Uh, in receiving certain, uh, uh, I will say, benefits, uh, level playing field, uh, I'll call them rather than benefit. But I'll stop there for the questions that uh, those in the audience have for us. Uh, thank you. Uh, Leon McDougall, Chief Diversity Officer at The Ohio State University Wexner <laughs> Medical Center. I want to commend the organizers for organizing this event. I'm going to make a brief observation and then pose a question. So. Coming from the medical field, we're trying to cure cancer. We're trying to decrease deaths from high blood pressure and stroke. And, and what I'm kind of hearing as a physician about the conversation in the legal setting is, and it, it may just, it's like, we're here to tell you what you can't do. So how can we uh, change the narrative to, as lawyers, as a law school, we're going to collaborate perhaps with medicine to reframe this narrative to have a mission focused goal and everyone at the table come together and say, how are we going to fix this big problem? That's what I'm kind of missing here. I'm hearing a lot of just this case, that case, this case, that case. You can't do this. You discriminate against this person. Uh, so I'll shut up and sit down. So how can that happen? Well, I, I guess because I am a lawyer, you know, if I if it was me sitting on a team with doctors, I would naturally want the doctors to probably first say some stuff, and the, the lawyers just kind of listening and giving the legal advice. Um, I, I don't want to put myself in the, the shoes of how to approach the practice of medicine or you know how to um, govern medical organizations. But um, I think the more empirically rigorous your sort of justification is or your sort of articulation is, I think the more respect that positions will get. So, I mean, for instance, we hear about, do, is the doctor of the same race as the patient and whether there's a connection there? So one question I have is, when I go to the doctor's office just as a patient, usually my interaction is with someone like a nurse or a physician's assistant, and the doctor comes in, you know, for like two minutes or something, and it, Maybe Austin's getting overcrowded, you know. <laughs> also, I know we have a shortage of doctors. We can talk about whether the credentials are too strict. And also, I know every legislative session, like the difference between what a doctor must, what can only a doctor do versus a nurse or physician's assistant. But most of my interaction is with like, you know, not the doctor. So if you're gonna say for earning an MD, you know, well, maybe it really does depend on the particular uh, practice, even differentiated by practice area. So, you know, whatever, neurosurgery versus, pediatrics versus dermatology, you know, different fields, and then go even deeper within that field, right? Like which particular um, aspects of care, does, does that matter the most? And then what's the mechanism to best dispense that uh, care to the person? Again, what is it from the doctor? Is it from, you know, another professional or whatever? And we can talk about that. But I think if you're just saying, wouldn't it be great if our, our numbers were a certain way for the class, and then you don't get to that level of detail, then the, the other side would probably say, well, it sounds like you're more motivated by politics than by medicine. So that's a more of a narrow response to my question. I'm not just talking about the doctor, provider, patient relationship. I'm talking about 
this prestigious law school. We're here uh, at one of the top medical schools, and we have uh, a very uh, august panel of experts. My question is, uh, I gave you kind of an example in medicine, We, because someone made the comment earlier about, well, what? seems as though medicine is advanced further in general regarding knowing the value of diversity. And I'm going to propose that is because we're trying to solve big problems. And we know that diversity helps to do that. And I'm just, I, I, I think we, I think law and medicine can learn a lot from each other. I just think we need to have a bigger vision regarding uh, the, the practice of, of, of law regarding, uh, I, I'm just not hearing the, you know, we're gonna to go to the moon or we're going to, uh, we're going to eliminate injustice uh, with uh, policing. I'm, I'm just, I'm just not, so, and that's where that diversity comes into play, it's important. <laughs> so I'll just sit down. I, My I, response thank you. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, I'll respond to that or join. Can. Okay. I guess, frankly, I think the question's unfair. Uh, the mission of the panel was exactly to talk about this case and that case on the thought that the trajectory of the law is relevant. And I think all the uh, panelists did so. And I think it's unrealistic to expect us in 80 minutes to solve 250 years of race problems and racial relations in the United States. Uh, if you wanted to look at you know, some of the deeper issues, I think the preceding panel uh, which was asked to look at some of that and look at issues of environmental justice and housing, um, criminal justice. Yes, those are incredibly important and the work of that panel was important as well. Um, and the only thing I would also say is, you know, I, I think we have to get beyond a 1960s conception of race and ethnicity. The, the, the world is different than it was then, partly because of Supreme Court decisions that permit interracial marriage and that have eliminated de jure segregation of schools, but that also mean that the, the law may need to evolve and race is more complicated than it was. We have many more multiracial people. We're recognizing that certain racial clusterings where the Korean is lumped together with the Sri Lankan and the El Salvadorian is lumped together with the Argentinian don't make a heck of a lot of sense. And so, uh, you know, uh, I guess I'll stop there, but I, I um, I think it wasn't our mission on this panel, at least, to solve race discrimination. I, can I, I just want to say one quick thing, which is that, um, sorry, uh, I agree with that vision that you've outlined, and I wish we could be there. But as, um, I, again, with the real politique, we are in a world where there have been several decades of a backlash legal movement in, contra in opposition to the civil rights movement, which is on many fronts including racial justice, and they have made a significant number of appointments to the Supreme Court through very close presidential elections and other things that have put six justices on the court that have a very strong top-down view. And as much as I would like to engage in that enterprise, the constitutional as being interpreted by that court does not, as a first principle, allow for that conversation. That is where I think we are, and I'm disappointed that that's where we are. So I have, now I have three questions. So I, I, unfortunately, we're out of time with this panel, but maybe we can sort of talk, you know, in the room while we're um, setting up for the next panel. Okay. All right. Thank you.